we're diagnosing children with anxiety disorders at unprecedented rates. And even the kids that aren't getting diagnosed, we're seeing much more higher levels of stress in our young people, which is obviously very concerning. It's also kind of stupid, if I can put it that way, uh, when you realize that they're also the safest children to ever walk the planet. <laughs> you know, there's something really wrong about this, that we're raising very, very anxious young people when they're so safe. And then they get so anxious we have to treat them for a mental health problem. That we call anxiety. The, the, you know, one of the interesting things, and a really important thing to think about uh, tonight as we talk about children's emotional growth and, and we, as we talk about anxiety, is to remember that anxiety for sure is now a mental health problem, but it doesn't, it shouldn't be. That at, at its best, anxiety is a really useful and important human emotion. You know, and you see that from time to time as a parent. I have two kids, well, kid adults, adultescents, as I like to call them. 23 and 21. Um, my daughter, by the way, 23 years old, has graduated from her undergraduate degree and she's living back home with me, the boomerang effect. She's back. <laughs> yeah. And we have a new name for, we've, we've got a new stage of development. After adolescence, we call it emerging adulthood. And it goes from 18 to 28. <laughs> and I'm in the midst of it. Claire is now 23, Sam's 21. My son Sam, when, when Sam turned 16, the day he turned 16, he went downtown and took his test to get his uh, G1, the, the, the ticket in Ontario that allows you to practice driving with your dad in the car. That's my standard transmission Volkswagen clunking around the neighborhood. <laughs> and you know, suddenly Sam was one of the most devoted learners I'd ever seen. Got his work ethic, went right up. <laughs> We practiced and worked at it. I mean, he was really focused on driving. And the day that he could take his road test, and that's to get his G2, that's the permit to drive without his father in the car, he gets up and goes downtown and takes his test, and bad news, he passed. <laughs> now, I don't know if any of you have been in that moment where your child says to you, Dad, Mom, can I have the car keys? Talk about anxiety, right? You know, our anxiety now, which has also got to be one of our themes. You know, in that moment, a lot of things go through your head like, no, we sold the car, you know? <laughs> We're a cycling family now, Sam. <laughs> but you don't. You turn the keys over, and off he goes out into the big bag world, full of danger, behind the wheel of, uh, of an automobile. He's dangerous himself. It's scary, you know? and, and uh, and then, but then what happens is life goes on and Sam's driving and, you know, it's a, it's a couple months later, it's a Sunday, and Sam needs a car for something, and off he goes to run his errand. He comes back about 15 minutes early, uh, earlier than expected. We thought he'd be gone for a bit, he's right back, and he's looking a bit weird. And uh, it turns out, yeah, he, he got a ticket, he got a traffic ticket, tra moving violation, rolling through a stop sign. You know, and at first you could, he was sort of like, stupid cop. You know, I wasn't really rolling that fast. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, a $120 ticket and three demerit points, these got his attention. So, you know, all of a sudden, you know, if now we're driving around the neighborhood together and he practically puts the parking brake on at every stop sign. <laughs> Cops are like jumping out of bushes everywhere, right? What emotion is he feeling? Anxiety. He's anxious about getting it, he's anxious about, and I'm happy about it. <laughs> I am, right? That's, it sounds like a punchline, and it is, but it's actually true. We actually want our children to be adaptively anxious. They need to be anxious about the right things in the right degree. And if they're not, they're in big trouble. Anxiety is an emotion in the fear family of emotions. Fear, one of the most basic emotions to all animals. All animal life, every animal has fear. It's way back in the lizard brain that we have carrying around the base of our brain. Very primitive animal response to danger. It's an in the moment response to threat. The fight flight reflex. If you don't have fear, you die in the animal world, right? You're a zebra, you think lions are cute, you're dying, right? <laughs> you need fear. And one of the things to note about fear, by the way, before we get to anxiety, is fear has an override switch. When you have a fear response, 
your brain is doing the fear thing and it's not doing anything else. You're not wondering what you're going to make for dinner. You're not wondering how you look now. It's your, you're having a bad hair day. You don't care. You're just fighting or taking like, it, when fear is in the system, that's all your brain is going to do. Anxiety is a lot like fear, except it's always anticipatory. Anxiety is the anticipation of something, which if it were to happen, would be fearful. That's what it is. It's, so anxiety equals fear plus planning. You need your lizard brain and your human brain to feel anxiety. And we're the only species with this part of the brain, we're the only species with anxiety. It's what, and if you think about it, anxiety is what actually sets us apart from the animal kingdom. It's the quintessential human emotion. Picture our caveman ancestors sitting around the cave, some cold autumn day, you know, the, the winter winds are beginning to blow, and some smart caveman, or probably cavewoman actually, says, uh-oh, winter's coming, Better renovate the cave. You know, guys, get out and get some more meat and some furs. And, you know, we start to anticipate things. And we build villages and we domesticate animals and cultivate crops. And we remember that the Huns came over that hill, so we'll build a wall before they come. Right? You can see so many of these, these steps of civilization are all in the service of making sure that the future is okay. Our capacity to worry now and plan for the future is what sets us apart from the animal kingdom. It's a reminder of how important it is for your child to grow up to be adaptively anxious. Our kids aren't going to grow up to be hunter-gatherers. They're living in 2017. They're going to be living... This is a very think-ahead society. We have to be thinking about all kinds of stuff in the future. Job performance reviews and mortgage payments and our children's uh, education savings plans down the road. It goes on and on. We're, we're constantly looking ahead. And that's why we all live with anxiety. The problem with anxiety is we can very easily get too worried about something that isn't as great a threat as we think it is. Right? We can exaggerate the threat in our minds. The other problem with anxiety is that while fear goes with flight, anxiety goes with avoidance. Let's picture someone being anxious. Let's picture a six-year-old girl who is going to have an anxious moment. Let's, let's say she's playing ice hockey. In the summer, she says to you, Mom and Dad, sign me up for house league ice hockey. I want to be Haley Wickenheiser. I can't be Queen Victoria. I'm going to be Haley Wickenheiser. Sign me up. You take her out to house league hockey. She goes the first week, and it's way harder than she ever expected. Every time she tries to shoot, she falls over. The coach seems mean. He's kind of yelling. All the other girls seem better than her. Her toes freeze. She falls over 17 times. She counts. It's a tough Saturday. The next week, a week goes by. She's at home. She's watching Dora the Explorer and in her PJs eating Fruit Loops. About as low as you could be on the anxiety scale without being dead, right? <laughs> Chilled right out. Okay, and and let's and so let's so we'll have a little. Can you picture? I told you I had, this is where I have PowerPoint would be handy. Okay, here's a graph. Okay, and on this scale, on this axis, we'll put anxiety from really low to moderate to getting bad to getting me freaked out. Oh my God, to panic. Ah! Okay, something like that. And on this axis, we'll put time, really seconds and minutes ticking away. Let's picture her mind. She's watching Dora the Explorer. Things are good. Ultimately, they might get boring, by the way. Very little anxiety equals boredom. So she's watching Dora the Explorer. She's hanging out. You poke your head in and you say, OK, time to go to hockey, 10 minutes. She starts to anticipate. What happens to her anxiety? It starts to build. What happens when it gets into this uncomfortable range? What does she do? What does every six-year-old do? What does she try? Stomach ache. I once asked that question to a group of six-year-olds, and a boy said, tell them you've got a broken ankle. And, you know, and then the boy next to him said, no, 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 they can check that. Do the stomach ache. <laughs> Every kid knows this, right? Try to get out of it. I don't want to go to hockey. You've got a stomach ache. Okay. So now, okay, you're with, we're right here. I don't want to go to hockey. What happens if you say, okay, we don't have to go to hockey? What happens next? 
this goes right back down again to Dora the Explorer levels. Okay? From a behavioral perspective, this moment is very reinforcing. That was a wonderful payoff. That felt great. Anxiety doesn't feel good. And because it felt so good, the next week I'm going to avoid even sooner. Week three, by week four, I've quit. Avoidance is addictive. It's one of the big problems with anxiety. Most parents know this intuitively. So they say, I know it was tough last week, but we got to go to hockey. I don't want to go to hockey. The coach is mean. I know it was a tough week last week. We've got to go. We're leaving in 10 minutes. We lend our children our adult will. Right? Get her out the door, into the car, and maybe her anxiety continues to climb. You get to the rank and the coach looks meaner than ever. Right? Get into the dressing room and there was a men's league game there last night. It really stinks. Right? <laughs> now you want to go home. Okay? Now, and it can feel like, so when you're on this uphill, you can picture this anxiety curve, when you're on the uphill, it can feel like your head's going to blow off. Like it's just awful on this upswing. But what happens is, always with anxiety, psychiatrists call this the anxiety hill. It always plateaus, stops building. It might be at a fairly high rate still. She gets out on the ice, it's freaky. Now she's trying to skate again. She, she get, they have a warm up. She gets to know, she's introduced to the girls on her line. They go out, they almost score. She gets off, the coach taps her on the back of the helmet. Great shift. All of a sudden, she's eyeing the gate to get back on the ice. What's happened to her anxiety? Well, it's gone up, it plateaued, and now it's dropped down a bit. It's in a moderate range. There's still lots of anxiety in the system. It's dropped down, though. But yeah, she's anxious. There's sharp skates. There's competition. She's vigilant. She's alert. The coach is still yelling. So there's a lot of the anxiety system operative, but it no longer feels toxic. She's on the, it's about the same level as it was when she tried to avoid. If I had a PowerPoint slide, I'd have illustrated that beautifully. <laughs> but you can see what I'm talking about here, right? She's now in a really uh, useful psychological state to learn about. Once we get to the other side of the hill, and we're on the ice and we're into the game, like she is now, we're in a psychological state that social scientists call flow. 